craziness in the lobby on the way in. We got maple bacon donuts because we'll leave the pink ones for Mother's Day, right, fellas? And then uh, we've got root beer out there. We've got some photo opportunities, all that stuff you can take with your kids, build some memories. It'll be a good time. But we are excited that you're here. Let's jump into what we have for today because today we're going to do a special message about Father's Day. We're not only going to talk to fathers, but we are going to talk to fathers. And so, man, I was super blessed growing up with a dad uh, who loved me. He encouraged me. Pastor Dan was an amazing father to me. And, and one of the things that I always loved about my dad is he, he was tremendous at identifying when there was more in me than I thought there was. He was like, man, there's more in you. You can do better than that. He was an encourager, man. There, you got something in you. Don't settle for status quo. He was always put it into my mind. Matter of fact, the college, the only college conversation me and my dad ever had. All right. So you ready for this? So he sat me down one day. I we were going to have the college conversation. And I thought it was like, man, you got to get good grades. You got to do this, you got to do that. And I did have to get good grades. But one of the things he told me, he was like, I don't care if you go to college or not. And I was like, this is different. And he said, I don't care if you go to college or not. He said, here's what I care about. He said, don't make someone else rich your whole life. He said, so find out what you're good at, start the business, you become the owner and let other people work for you. And I was like, well, all right then. I didn't think it would look like this. No, I'm just kidding. But but uh, one of the things he always did was encourage me, but, but also uh, one of the things he always did was like, he identified in me, man, like give it your best. Always like give it everything you got. And a lot of people don't know this. Pastor Dan was an incredible baseball player. So he played, yeah, he played, uh, played baseball. He was a catcher. Uh, and so, man, he was like dangerous on the baseball field. And so when I was little, naturally, what did I do? play baseball, right? And so then uh, we realized that I had like ADHD issues on a baseball field. And so they tried to put me in the outfield at one point and I was like, listen, man, y'all gonna have to come on and hit a ball over here. Cause they, they're making corn dogs over there. All right. So I'm going to go over. So uh, <clears throat> then I realized if I'm a catcher, I get to play in every play. And so I was like, be a catcher. That was all he needed. So like, I think he spent way too much money probably on like buying me like all the best catcher gear. I'm like eight years old. Okay. I have no business having this quality of gear, but he's like, oh, you're playing baseball. Well, baseball didn't pan out for me. Right. Uh, I was playing football at the time. And then I discovered hockey and I was like, bro, I get to wear ice skates or roller skates and I get to hit people. I was like, yes. Right. Problem is. Pastor Dan don't know nothing about hockey, all right? So, like, it went from him coaching me in, in baseball. He's like, you got to do this, and you can come up on one knee, and you got a thing, and then you throw it, and then, like, Brett knows what I'm talking about. He's a big, like, yeah. like, you do this, and he's like, man, he was coaching me, and it's like, you got to look for this, and you look for that. And then I went to the hockey, and he was like, ah, be aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm about, to, I'm about to score. I got the puck, you know what I mean? I'm going through. He's like, be aggressive. And that was, that, was, that was about the extent of his coaching me in hockey. <clears throat> but I'll never forget, I had an amazing dad, man. And, and even whether it was hockey or baseball, he always wanted, and then he could see there's something more in you, and I'm going to do everything I can to pull it out because I had a good dad. And maybe some of you didn't have a great dad, but, but I did. And what I want to talk to you about today, uh, because today, typical to Mother's Day, Father's Day, is I want to talk to you uh, about fathers, but I want to talk to you about be, being believers and more importantly, I want to show you what we can see in Jesus, because every time we come here, we're going to talk about Jesus. And even if we talk about fathers, we're going to talk about Jesus and how Jesus can show us how to be better fathers or better mothers or, or so on. But how many of you guys know that it is so important that fathers are in the home? Like it's so important to have good, godly fathers in our homes. How many guys will agree with me that we got a generation that's suffering an identity crisis right now? Like, like this <clears throat> epidemic of fatherlessness has created an epidemic of a lack of identity in kids. And when I say kids, I'm not talking about 12 to 18. I'm talking about 12 to 38. Because we got young adults, Tupac said babies having babies. That's how I feel right now. Like, I feel like we got people that don't know who they are having kids that don't know who they are. And so we've, we've perpetuated a cycle of people who are lacking identity, lacking knowing who they are, lacking a consistency as fathers uh, now having kids. And we're seeing the same cycle. And so because of that, we got kids with no awareness of who they are. It's the reason why we see boys with no awareness of what it means to have masculinity. And we see girls with no awareness of what it means to experience proper affection. 
because fathers are responsible for both. And so we have to understand how important it is to have fathers in the home, but more importantly, godly fathers in the home. And so today I do want to talk about that, but as I unpack this, I want to unpack this because it's not just things that we need from fathers. Quite frankly, a lot of what we're going to talk about is really just things that make us better as believers. And so there's different types of fathers. And so the three that I kind of want to put in front of you out of the gate, uh, the three different types of absent fathers, because there's four fathers. There's the present father, and we're going to talk about that, but the three types of absent fathers. So there's the absent fathers from the home, say from. Absent fathers from the home, which means they're not even in the house. They're, they're gone. They're, the, the father doesn't exist in the kids' lives. There's absent fathers in the home. Say in. So there's absent fathers in the home. That means they're just surviving from one day to another. Like they're physically there, but they're not really there. And we can all think of fathers that are wa- that way. Then there's absent fathers at the home. Say at. Absent fathers at the home, they're striving not just for what uh, is important. They're striving, but not for what's important. They're, sh- they're working. They're, they're trying, but, and they may be at home, but they're missing out on the priorities that are valuable when they're in the home. And so those are things that I want you to see. And so as we unpack that a little bit, and I'll bring that up towards the end of service, I want you to understand that there's a number of ways that fathers are absent, but I want to show you a number of different ways where fathers can be present. And so uh, I want you to go to Matthew 3, verses 13 through 15. That's kind of where we're going to start, and then we're going to catch it uh, again, 16 through 17 in a second. But Matthew 3, 13 through 15, and this is the story of Jesus. He's getting ready to be baptized. And I, and I use this scripture all the time on Father's Day because something really powerful happens in the scripture. And so Matthew 3, 13 through 15, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you come to me? Like, I can see Jesus is like, yo, John, I need you to baptize. And John's like, uh, Paul's. Like, you should be baptizing me, Jesus, not me baptizing you. And so he says, hey, you come to me. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now, I don't know how that unpacks, but I got a feeling Jesus is like, no, John, you got to baptize me. And John's like, oh, okay. But then like on the inside, I don't know how you would be. I'd be like, you want me to baptize Jesus? (laughs) Legendary. You know what I'm talking about? Like no one else got to do it. Okay, so that's how I would be. That's how I read. Y'all read your Bible however you want. Okay, so. So, so John baptizes Jesus. Now, we're going to come back to that in a second. But, but as we do that, I want to show you three things that Jesus actually starts introducing to us that we as fathers, as believers, yes, but definitely as fathers today, I want to identify three areas where we need to become better, quite frankly. And the first one is spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline. And when I say that, what do I mean? I'm talking about prayer. I'm talking about worship not reading our Bibles. I mean, as fathers, we need to get better at our spiritual disciplines in the home. And, and if we're all being honest, ladies, gentlemen, guys that don't have kids, whatever, we can all be honest. We could all just be better at that in general, right? Like that's not a secret. We all look at ourselves in the mirror and go, man, I really wish I was better at. So that's not really a secret, but we could be better at our spiritual disciplines. Here's the reality. Some of us want great spiritual children one day, but we're not investing into them today. So like, let me go ahead and just help you out of the gate, okay? Listen, we we need to be raising kids that love God, but the only way our kids are gonna know to love God is that they see us loving God. And so we we invest in these spiritual disciplines. And we go to Matthew 6, we actually see Jesus kind of give us a good template at least for that in the Lord's Prayer. The disciples come to him and say, how should we pray? And so this is his response. He says, this then is how you should pray. Now out of the gate, we can see that Jesus makes it a priority to pray. But he, then he goes on and says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And, and in that, what do we see? That he puts a value on worship. Like, how would be your name? Like, your name is great. How, like, how would be your name? Your name is wonderful. Your name is above all names. And in our prayer life, in, in our spiritual disciplines, to put Jesus, to put God in his rightful place and say, above everything is you. 
So he says, how will it be your name? Your name is great. So worship is happening. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And that looks like submission. Say submission. And if there's anything that I've ever seen guys push back on, it's that one. And quite frankly, that's not just gentlemen, that's ladies too. Because how many guys know we love what God wants when it's what we want? But we really start having a hard time when what God wants doesn't match what we want. And so, so he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. And what would happen in our prayer life if we started saying, God, more than what I want, I want what you want. So where my heart doesn't fit your heart, show me that and fix that in me so that I can be aligned with you. Because that's what we need. Fathers that are connected and aligned with God on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And that's reliance. And friends, but definitely fathers, you need God more than you need you. We need God more than we need ourselves. And so 100% reliant. Give us today. God, everything I'm going to need today, I'm going to get it from you. And 100% reliance on God. He keeps on going, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that's forgiveness. And hear me today, fathers, many of you need to let go of the past so that you can raise children in the present to be successful in the future. You need to disconnect and forgive what happened to you so that you can be present in the now to raise kids that aren't suffering the same thing you suffered from. The only reason your kids become victims of what you went through is if you carry it into their life. So for some of us, we need to forgive. I'm not saying forget. I'm not saying I'm not saying, what I'm saying is you do need to forgive. You need to look inside and you need to look to God above to help you let go of what happened to you so that you can be a better father for the future. And so we need to forgive what's back there so that we can see what's in front of us, especially as fathers and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that is faith. God, I need you, I need your protection, I need your help, I need your guidance. How many of you have ever made a terrible decision and you look at it afterwards and you're like, yo, I did not pray about that. Everybody. Right? But you got through the end of it and you was like, you know what, that's crazy. Next time I'm going to include God. <laughs> right? And then sometimes we do, we're looking for stuff to happen, we didn't pray about it and it didn't come through. And then we get through on the other side and we're like, thank God I did not marry that person. It's the grace of God it didn't work out. Right? In Jesus' name. Okay, so we need spiritual discipline. The next thing that we need, if we're going to be godly fathers, good believers, but godly fathers, is we need humility. We need humility. Listen, fathers, your family's not looking for you to have all the answers. Your family's looking to see that you're connected to the one that has all the answers. And in and, and humility, we need to understand that there's a big difference between weakness and meekness. You see, because weak is being absent of power, but being meek is having power under control. And for some of us, we don't exercise humility because we think it makes us look weak, not understanding that there is a big difference between weakness and meekness. And to help kind of further this, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine a couple years back, and he's an MMA fighter. So he's a professional MMA fighter. And so uh, we were in Biloxi at the fights that were going on, going on over there because he was sponsored. So he had to be at the event. And I was helping him. So I got to hang out with him and go backstage. No big deal. Okay. So anyway, so, uh, and so I was hanging out with him. And so we, uh, we were out eating and he had on his shirt that had on like his fighting brand and all that stuff. And so we were over there where there's this guy that had way too much to drink. And so he starts, like, berating my buddy. Like, he's like, you're nothing. You're trash. I'll take you right now. Just, like, selling out to him. And then he started getting, like, aggressive. Like, he starts talking about his mom and, like, all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, first of all, this dude had no business talking trash to my six-year-old niece, let alone this guy. Okay, so I was like, what, what are you doing? And so I'm looking at my buddy, and I'm like, and in my mind, I know me. Like, you got about 20 seconds with that before I'm like, okay. It's a good thing we're in Biloxi, because in Pensacola, I might lose my church, but nobody knows me here. So I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ah. 
And so we were there and uh, we were, and I'm looking at my buddy and like, he's just eating his sushi, unbothered. And I'm bothered. I'm like, you gonna talk to this? Like, and here's the reality. Anybody that hangs out with fighters know you can usually look at a fighter's ears and tell them whether or not you want to catch those hands or not. They got puffed up ears. That's because, yeah, so they just, we know, all right? And so, buddy, I'm like, what? why is, this man is, he's going to lose his life. It's going to be the end. And so, but I look over at my buddy and I'm like, yo, like, are you not even bothered by this? And I'll never forget he told me something that I was like, wow. Like, that's crazy. He said, it's not worth, or he said, it's pointless to fight someone when winning doesn't mean winning. And I was like, huh. He said, when I fight, I get paid, I get trophies, I get a belt. So when I fight, it means something. He said, fighting this dude doesn't mean anything. He said, even if I win, I won't win. And I'll never forget that because it taught me something not about fighting. It taught me something about life. Fathers, some of you need to learn that winning doesn't mean winning. Because winning at the cost of your kid's identity, winning at the cost of your kid's confidence, winning at the cost of your marriage doesn't mean winning. You lost. You might have won the argument. You might have proved your point. But you might have lost. And I think there's something to be said about humility in our homes. Because for some of us, we need to get better at realizing that, just like I put in your notes, meekness comes with an understanding that winning doesn't always mean winning. What does it mean? When Jesus went to the cross, Philippians 2.8, when, when Jesus went to the cross, it says, him being found in human form, he, what, humbled, say humbled, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the cross. Does that mean that Jesus became weak? Did he ever become powerless? Or was it power under control? You see, humility doesn't mean you don't have power. Humility means you know how to control power. And I'm going to tell you today, as believers, I think that in our, in our workplaces, we can become better by becoming humble. In our homes, we can certainly, as, as fathers, but also as mothers for some of you, as, as some that don't even have kids, maybe it's not in your home, maybe it's not with your kids, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's in your friendships, maybe it's at your job, maybe it's at school, maybe it's with the people that you work with. Maybe you could start exercising and we could start exercising humility in our relationships enough that we realize that the things we would have fought about and not won aren't even worth fighting over. In my house, uh, man, uh, Eli lives with me, and so uh, <laughs> he lives with me and my wife, and he reminds me of something that I taught him. Well, that's very irritating, right, parents? So, uh, and so sometimes I'll be poking the bear, and when I mean poking the bear, I mean finding that point uh, that annoys my wife and poking at it. And sometimes I'll be poking the bear, and uh, I'll be proving my point, and he'll look over at me and be like, is that the hill you want to die on? I'm like, go to your room. But he's right. And let me ask you a question. How many of us are fighting on about stuff that that's not even the hill that we should be dying on? I literally tell people in marriage counseling sometimes, I'm like, does that matter? That doesn't matter. Shut up. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Okay, so that makes everything better. No, like, like, man, we could exercise some humility in our relationships. And we could see our relationships get much healthier and honestly, I believe we would represent Jesus better sometimes if we would understand that we don't have to win every fight. Because sometimes winning the fight doesn't mean winning at all. And then next is instruction. Instruction. Fathers need to be teaching their children. And this one I am pointing at you a little bit, fathers. I, I believe we need to be teaching our children. We need to instruct them. We need to guide them. We need to lead them. We need to give them the words that they need to know. We need to teach them things. We need them to understand why these things are important. We need to help them understand values. We need to help them understand character. We need to help them understand how to do certain things. Listen, fathers, you need to be giving instruction to your kids. You need to teach them what matters. You need to teach them what doesn't matter, right? Proverbs 22.6 makes it pretty clean. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he gets older, he won't depart from it. So we need to teach our kids stuff. I remember uh, 
Growing up, my dad taught me all kinds of things. And I remember I would grow up and, and he, he would be teaching me uh, how to build stuff. And, and just recently, we were uh, getting ready for this hurricane, tropical storm, uh, whatever it was that rolled through here. So uh, we were getting ready for it and Pastor Justin came over to me. Now, in case you don't know, Pastor Justin's not exactly a handyman. All right? Not good with the drill, good with the spreadsheet. Okay, so... And so he comes over to me. He's like, hey, man, we've got uh, the storm is rolling in. And one of our doors had like a crack in it. We needed to install this thing. And so uh, he's like, we need to install that in case the storm gets here. It doesn't blow water into the lobby and all this stuff. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's go do that. Well, I have you know, I'm not a doorologist. Okay. I don't know how to do that. So like, I've never installed one of these a day in my life. And so <clears throat> I am, I come in, he's like, yeah, we need to install them. I'm like, how do you do that? And he was like, oh, you drill. And I'm like, cool. All right, perfect. So and so we go in and I grab the drill. But here's, here's one thing that was beautiful. I grew up in my dad's garage just constantly watching him build stuff. And one of the things he always taught me was there's always a way to get it done. So get it done. And I was like, so that, that was kind of in me. So literally he's like, yo, we got to do this. And I'm like, he's like, I don't know how to do it. I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know so what do we do? We grab a couple of drills. I go in there. We like knock them all out and we take care of it. And, and, and it was one of those things that was like, I remember thinking in that moment, like, Thank God my dad taught me how to do some stuff. Because, like, otherwise, I ain't going to lie to you. I'd totally be the guy that, like, hey, we need to call somebody for that. But I'm glad, like, I sat next to him on his workbench. And I said, how come you cut it that way? And he would, he would show me. How, how come you're building that? And he would show me those things. And those things made a difference, not just in who I was when I was six, but who I am at 32. Four? I don't know. <laughs> I'm really bad with ages. In my 30s. <laughs> right? My mind is telling me I'm 32 with them knees, though. Okay, anyway, so, and so uh, I want you to understand that we need to be teaching our kids, but more importantly, and hear me, fathers, we need to be teaching our kids what it means to be godly, not just good. We need to be instructing our kids. And, and hear me, and I want you to lean in on this for a second, whether you're at home, whether you're in the room. I really want you to grab a hold of this. If you've got little kids, you've got five-year-olds, six-year-olds, hear me, listen to me, lean in on this. Don't disown their spirituality now and then show up on our doorstep 10 years from now and want us to fix what you broke. Okay, so like if you got kids and you're not raising them in church, you're not teaching them the church is important, you're not introducing them to Jesus, they don't understand the gospel. Listen, hear me, I love you and hear me enough to know that I love you enough to tell you this. Don't bring your kids to us when they're 15 and want us to fix what you abandoned for 15 years. If we want godly kids, let's raise godly kids, but let's not hope for something we're not creating. Nowhere in our life do we get to say, I really hope this is the outcome, but have no preparation for it. No one gets to hope dinner's on the table, but not cook it. No one gets to hope that you're going to be fit, but not work out and die. No one gets to hope for anything. So hear me, parents, and hear me, fathers. If you want your kids to end up somewhere, make sure you're creating and following through on the plan to get them there. Because it's going to be really hard for us to fix what you never cared about in the beginning. And hear me. Your kids are watching. Like your kids will worship the way you worship. Your kids will care about the Bible the way you care about the Bible. Your kids will care about prayer as much as you care about prayer. So what is their future? And hear me, I'm not here trying to beat you up. I'm here to let you know there's time to change it if you need to change it. And we want to help you in the process but we can't wait till it's too late, never instruct, and then hope things go well. Many of you guys have seen some of the pictures uh, on Facebook or Instagram, any of those things. It's like, what happens when dad's in charge? Have y'all ever seen that? It's like they got a kid and they're just throwing Cheerios at it, trying to land one in the mouth or whatever. You know? It's like, and for, for many of us, that is like essentially kind of like what we believe it looks like when dad's in charge. What would it look like if we sent pictures to our wives of our kids reading the Bible with us when dad's in charge. How different would the future be if we became intentional in the present, getting ready for what's coming? Man, it's there, right? So I'm going to take you back to Matthew 3, 16 through 17, and we're going back to Jesus getting baptized. Because we've seen what we can do as parents to be better, but now I want to show you what kids need 
So this is how we can better as parents and quite frankly, just as believers in general. But I want to show you what kids really need. And so as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Say beloved. Whom I love. Say love. And with him, I am well pleased. Say pleased. So I want you to grab a hold of that because this is something I visit every Father's Day because I really want you to understand this is the framework for how we father. So this is my beloved son with whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased. And there are three things that every child needs and when they don't have it, it's chaos. And when they do have it, it's glorious. God gave it to Jesus. And if God gave it to Jesus, you bet your life you can give it to your kids. And so three things that show up, all right, quick, I'm going to give them to you. The first one is identification. You need to identify the kids in your life. You need to identify your children. When I say identify, I'm talking about recognition. I'm talking about a belonging. I'm talking about an association. You need to identify them. You are mine, all right? So, and I don't mean like, hey, you're mine. I brought you in this world. I can, I don't want to like, I'm talking about like, you are mine. You belong to me. You, you carry my name. You are part of this legacy. You are mine. Hear me. Our kids need to be identified because if they don't know who they belong to, they'll go looking to belong to someone else. And so we need to identify our children so that they know, no matter what happens in life, they know where to come back to. So we identify our children. This is my beloved son. God speaks directly to Jesus. The next thing that happens is he gives them affection. With whom I love, he says. This is my beloved son with whom I love. Every child needs affection. When I say child, I'm not talking about five and six years old. I'm talking about 15 and 16 as well. Fathers who have teenagers, listen to me. If you don't love your daughters, your daughters will go looking for love somewhere else. With whom I love. And sometimes we have, we have created this world where fathers showing affection is like an improper thing. I'm going to tell you today, fathers, love your daughters, love your sons. Show them that you love them. Hear me, they need love. They need fondness. They need a display of emotional liking. They need to be hugged. They need to be held. They need to be reminded that you love them. They need to know what affection is like because if they don't get the affection, they'll go looking for it elsewhere. And so they have identity, and then we need to show them affection. And then the last one, and quite frankly, uh, the most important out of the three, but it can't happen unless the other two happen, is affirmation. Affirmation. What do I mean by that? They need to be encouraged. They need to be celebrated. They need to be valued. They need to be affirmed. He says, this is my beloved son, identification, with whom I love, affection. And here's that last part, with whom I am well pleased. He affirmed him. Now, why does God affirm Jesus? Well, if you look in your Bible and you were to go to the very next chapter, what's about to happen is Jesus is about to go into the wilderness where he's going to be tempted by Satan and Satan's going to try to convince him he's not who he says he is. If you were really this, then you would do this. He said, if you're actually this, then command this. And so he actually goes in and then what happens later on is we actually see that Jesus is tried and then he's tested and then he's accused. And, and what God knows is there's something coming on the way. So before you get to the wilderness, before you get to the testing, before you get to the trials, before you get to the trouble, before you get to all of those things and you kind of feel like you're on your own, I'm going to identify, I'm going to show you affection and I'm going to affirm you're mine and I am yours and we're together, and I love you. We're a part of this, and I want you to know before anyone else shows up and tries to convince you of something that you're not, I want to show you what you are. And hear me, if God does it for Jesus, we should do it for our kids, because here's what's happening. I'm here to tell you right now, parents, that, that there's a day coming where they're leaving your house. And just like God did before Jesus, before he got to the wilderness, you need to do with your kids before they get to the wilderness. Because hear me, when they get to middle school, when they get to high school, when they get to elementary school, for God's sake, like when they get to college, when they get, listen, there's a whole world ready to test, try, and convince them that they're not what you say they are. 
And so they need a reminder, they need a consistent reminder of who they are, of who loves them, and who's proud of them, so that they don't go looking for love and affection and affirmation from the people who will destroy them. Hear me, there is an absolute desire from the world and the one that controls the world to destroy our kids. And I want you to get this. The kids who are suffering a sexual identity is because they never had a fatherly one. The kids who are pursuing love in all the wrong places is because they never got love in the right place. And the breakdown in society today, it's not because of our schools, it's not because of our education system, it's not because of our government, it's not because of our police system, it's not because of our politics. And don't get me wrong, I believe there's necessary reform in all of those places, but those didn't fail us inside the four walls failed us. We forgot what it looked like to love kids the way God loves us. But I'm here to tell you today that it's not too late. This is my beloved son. Identification. With whom I love. Affection. With whom I am well pleased. Affirmation. Those are the three things that fatherhood stands on. And here's the thing. Fathers, I want you to lean in on this for just a second. Mothers can't do it. Mothers can do a lot of things. But God designed you fathers to be the only ones that can do these things. So moms, y'all got y'all's list, okay? Stuff only y'all can do. And hear me, we ain't fighting over it. So like the birthing process, like y'all can have all that, all right? No arguments. Okay, so y'all got the W on that. Fathers, it is... Only you that can do it. You are the only one that can create identity. You're the only one. You're the only one that can help them understand true affection. Now, mothers, you can give affection. But fathers, you're the only one that can help them understand true affection. And you're the only ones that can establish affirmation. Moms can be proud of their kids, but the kids need their fathers to be proud of them there's a difference. So fathers, it is on you to do this. It is up to you to make sure that it happens. And so do it, lead well for you, for your kids, for God. This is my beloved son with whom I love and who I am well pleased. Do it before your kids are sent into the world be tried and tested. They need to know who they are. They need to know who loves them and they need to know who's proud of them. I always do sometimes what I call a this or that. And I did that for this. You can show your kids affection or they can go look for it in all the wrong places. You can show your kids affirmation or they can pursue it from all the wrong people. You can give your kids identity or they can try to find it in all the wrong things. And you can give your kids celebration or they will go where they are celebrated even if it's for all the wrong things the choice is yours parents fathers in particular today it's up to you and I pray that you take this message to heart even if you feel like you've done all the wrong things up till now even if you feel like you've failed this whole time It's not too late to turn it around. And the beautiful part is you're never done. Like when they turn 18, you're like, all right. You may feel that way, at least for the first six months. You may be like, get out. We're going on vacation for two, not four. No, I'm just kidding. Like you said, you may feel that way. But guess what? They need to be reminded of that when they're 20, when they're 30, when they're 40, and when they're 50. You're never done identifying, showing affection, and affirming. Because we always need to know who we are. We always need to know who loves us, and we always need to know who's proud of us. 
so that we don't end up chasing it in the wrong places. So there's three different types of fathers that I want to put in front of you today and and pray that I've helped you connect the dots to become the right one. As a father, you can survive, but have nothing to offer anyone else. You can survive, but you would have nothing to offer anyone else. You're just barely getting through for you. Call that passivity, where you're just passively moving through life, don't really care about much, and nothing's that big of a deal. As long as you get your way, you don't care if anyone else gets what they need. Terrible place to be. As a father, you can strive, but still not give your family what they need. And I call that activity. Because for some fathers, you're very active. You work hard. You're just not active in the right places. Doesn't mean you need to quit working. It needs you to figure out how to work and earn and do all those things as a father that you're doing, but also be active at the baseball games, the soccer games, the cheerleading practices, or the chess matches. I guess that's a thing. I don't know. Okay, cool. Thought so. Like a computer build off for your kids. I don't know. Whatever, whatever your kid does. <laughs> so you can survive, you can strive. And even when you're striving, I want to help you fathers understand something for just a second. Don't let the guilt of your inadequacies cause you to lean away from God. Let them draw you closer to him. So in the places where you feel like you've really messed this whole thing up, the places where you feel like, man, did I do anything right? Man, let your inadequacies, let your failures, let your shortcomings cause you to go to the one that can help you get it together. Don't let it create so much shame and guilt that you run from him. Because there's one person you really need. That's God. And then lastly, as a father, you can thrive in leading your home God's way. And that's productivity. So you can survive passively. You can strive actively, or you can thrive productively. And if you want to do this, I gave you a real, uh, this this real short list. Here's a little thing just to help you. You ready? Live a little, dads. Laugh a lot. You'd be shocked at what happens in a house when dad laughs. Love it all and thrive. Very simple. Right? I'll end with this. Dads, your family doesn't need a perfect father. They just need a present one. So be there. Love well. Because that, and I'm not trying to be corny or cliche, may not be how we change the world, but it'll be how we change our world. Let's pray today. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you that you are all that we need. God, I thank you that you have built in us a desire to love well, to have fathers that want to lead. And So God, I just pray that you prompt our hearts today that we would know you more and that we would reflect you more and that we, uh, as fathers in the room, God, but also just as believers, God, that we would exercise spiritual disciplines we know we need in our life, humility that we know we need to have in our life. And God, that we can instruct those in our lives. God, please help us today. We thank you. Ultimately, God, what we need is you. So we pray that you just help us and hold us. We thank you today and we love you. If you're here today and I just feel like God put this on my heart to pray for fathers. If you're a dad in here, if you're a father, would you just stand up all across this place? I want to pray just for you. Go ahead and stand up. It's all right. Go ahead and stand up. Your father in here, just all across this place. If you're close, if you're close to a father, if you just reach over and put a hand on a shoulder. I want to pray for dads in here. We talked at the beginning of the sermon about how important it is to have fathers, godly fathers in the home. We want to pray for you. So God, I pray right now for every 
father in this room. God, that you would release strength and courage and discernment and wisdom, Father, that you would revive with energy and with passion and with zeal to be godly men in, in their homes. Father, that you would, you would create a desire, a longing, not just to know you, but to show kids that you know. So God, I just pray right now, Father, that you would do a work in the hearts of all of our fathers, that you would help them strive, you would help them push, but God, you would help them thrive. That, that God, as they draw strength from you, God, that they would find themselves encouraged, they would find themselves uplifted, they would find themselves, God, looking to you, but also realizing that you are all that they need. And God, so I just pray as we're strengthened that we could identify, we could affirm, we could show affection to the children, and to the people that you've entrusted us with God so that we could be great fathers, Lord. God, I pray for rest right now for the fathers that are in this room and watching us online. For those who have found themselves feeling like a constant failure. I don't know why dads, but that's, that's what I feel like God is saying right now. Where you may have missed it, God caught it. And so God, I pray right now for the fathers who have felt like they missed key opportunities. They felt like they failed in key areas. God, I pray that you would show them that it's not too late to re-engage. It's not too late to step into the calling that you have put on their life. God, right now, I break addictions in Jesus' name. God, I break generational curses where their grandfather was something and their father was something and they feel like they're destined to be it. God, I pray that you show them that they are destined to be what you called them to be. They're destined to be and live the way you called them to live and they don't have to follow in the footsteps of the unrighteous, but you can establish new footsteps of the righteous. And so God, I pray that you do a stirring in their hearts, a drawing in their spirit, a renewing of their mind, and that you would set on them on a path, God, that would help them see that you have destined them for great fatherhood. You have destined them to lead a great family and that you are doing, finishing, completing, and establishing their family in your word and in your care. So God, help them today be all that you have called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's go to our Father's Church all across this place. You guys can be seated. Thank you. And so I want to pray right now. If you'll all bow your heads and close your eyes as we wrap up today. If you're here, I want to make this as simple as I can on you. Today, if you're here and you don't know our heavenly father. We, we oftentimes refer to God as our heavenly father as they do in the Bible. And you know you're not close to God today. You know about God maybe, but you don't know God. Sin in your life, just like all of us, may have separated you from God. But when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for your sins that you could know God. And today, if you want to know God, the Bible says that if we put our faith in Jesus, that when he died for our sins, we would be forgiven of our sins. We could experience an eternity with God in heaven. And so today, if that's you, I wanna pray this very simple prayer with you. I wanna invite you to re repeat it after me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me my sins. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. So I give you my life. Make me brand new. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. TC, let's give it up for all those that pray that. Perhaps for the first time, we celebrate with you. Awesome, awesome, awesome.